Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Philosopher's Couch. This is episode two. This time around, we're back in Colorado again, but we're not in Breckenridge. We are in the Twin Lakes. That's the closest. What do they have? Five buildings there? So I don't know. Yeah, 23 people. 23 people. So joining me for episode two here is Josh Herrian, another uh, non philosopher, right? No philosophy degrees. Correct. Okay. So we're here, though, to talk philosophy, to hear what Josh uh, thinks about philosophy in general and uh, some of his takes on some of the big questions, just like we did in uh, episode one. And speaking about episode one, Josh and Jamie and I all know each other rather well. And uh, Jamie was actually going to join us for this trip. So we're out to climb some more uh, mountains here in Colorado, but he actually got COVID. And so last uh, minute couldn't come out and join us. But Josh is here. He's agreed to join me on the uh, Philosopher's Couch. So just like with the first uh, episode, I'll have eight parts here. We'll begin by introducing Josh a little bit more and then kind of diving in. We'll go we'll get to his opinions on philosophy a little bit, um, get into his takes on the big questions. I have some Josh Herrian specific questions in mind as well. He'll take a dive into the philosophical abyss and answer some random questions and much, much more. So that's the uh, game plan here. I guess let's go ahead and dive in. So we know you're Josh Herring, but tell us a little bit more about who you are, what you do, and so on. So yeah, I uh, lived in Kearney for 23 years now. First met Brad in 1999 at UNK. Um, I came to college from Pierce, Nebraska, where I was born and raised, went to school, went to UNK to get away from kind of the small town culture that I'd grew up in, not that Kearney's huge, but wanted to experience something a little bigger, a little different, a little more diverse in terms of culture and people and ways of thinking. And it was an amazing experience for me. I think uh, it's kind of cliche, but I think going to college uh, in a different place and detaching myself away from what I was used to was so good for me. I was exposed to different people and different ideas, and so met my lifelong friends at college, Brad and Jamie and Dan, and, and I think it was so important for me intellectually and just to be exposed to different things. So went to college, graduated from UNK, and then stuck around in Kearney, uh, started to get into the banking world. I was just going to say real quick, you're actually, your oldest uh, daughter is going into college, right? You yeah. You go through that whole process. Yeah. And, so, so now I'm on the other end of that process, watching my oldest daughter, who just graduated high school, transition into that. And and it's interesting because she has the same mindset that I did, possibly because I've maybe brainwashed her subtly along the way. Conditioned her. Yeah. yeah, but she's very much wanting something different and a little bigger too. So she's going to Omaha, which is obviously bigger and new experience for her compared to Carney. So to her, Kearney was the small town and it was not diverse enough and she wants to go somewhere more diverse and bigger. And so I've stayed in Kearney, worked in the banking world. I've got uh, three kids that I've, that one's 18, like I mentioned, one's an 11 year old and one's a 10 year old. Um, so yeah. You've been, yeah, sort of immersed in the banking world since college pretty much, yeah. right? It's been, yep. uh, and so you kind of spoke to how we know each other then. Uh, I think you probably agree that like, at least for me, this is the case with my lifelong friends. Most of them are college. And so that's kind of what's true for both of us. That's how uh, we met. Um, so college was definitely pretty formidable uh, intellectually and socially in so many different ways. That's why I'm curious to see how it uh, you know, goes with Hannah, too. And yeah. then, like, it's going to be tough for you because I know how tight you guys are, too, having her out of the house now for the first time. So but. Yeah, it's so different. I, I mentioned how it's similar that she wants to do what I did at that age and get somewhere new and different, but we're exact opposites in terms of how we view family life. <clears throat> and by that, I mean, when I was 18 years old, I wanted nothing more than to get away from my house and Sounds my parents. Familiar. No offense, and, mom and dad. <laughs> and, and I wanted to do my own thing. And so much so that first Christmas break that rolled around as a freshman, I didn't even go home. I moved in with a friend. Wow. First summer, I didn't move home. I stayed in, in Kearney and got a place with somebody. Um, whereas Hannah, she very much values family, and we're very tight. As you mentioned, we have a really good bond. And so 
she, I think, is going to have a harder time maybe adjusting to being away from home, whereas I was just chomping at the bit. To this foreshadows so well, actually, one of the Josh-specific questions gets into your parenting and how great I think you are as a parent. I think that the fact that she is wanting to stay close and have that opposite mindset sort of speaks to how well you've done, I guess, raising her. her you did something right because she wants to stick around. Whereas, <laughs> And again, no offense, mom and dad, you guys did plenty right. But I, I just remember feeling the same way where the second I graduated, I wanted to get as far away from home as possible and experience everything else. But uh, money dictated otherwise. Yeah. Ended up, I guess, right? They say things work out for a reason, meeting future wife and yep. best friends and so on. So. Okay, that's a good uh, introduction, I think. Um, let's go ahead and move on then to your philosophy background or lack thereof. Again, no degrees in philosophy now. I can't remember. Um, did you actually ever take a philosophy course? No. Okay, so. I never did. I know Jamie, uh, Paula, my wife, uh, she, you know, most of the people I know, they actually took like one. Yeah, like an intro, least. but I never did. No. Okay, so was that something where you had, it was like an elective and you chose something outside of philosophy. Right. Okay. You know, it probably fell into like the humanities category where you choose a handful of right. them to meet your general study requirement. And I just never took that one, not necessarily because I was disinterested or not because it's like, oh, I hate that. I don't want that. It was just, oh, okay. I took a, I think a political science and a uh, sociology right. class. And so, Some overlap. yeah. And I just felt like, okay, I, have other things in my major I need to take. I don't have room or money or time to take another well, elective. You, your, I don't need. you got your fix from me anyway. Yeah, exactly. I had like a free philosophy class with you. So. That's right. Every day. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, let's start then with, so no philosophy background per se. That's not to say you haven't read some philosophy in there or, you know, you're probably familiar with some views just through discussions with me. Right. So um, in your view, what, let's start with this. Uh, and there's no right or wrong answer. What is philosophy? So philosophy to me, and again, a lot of this, <laughs> as you alluded to, my views, I think, have been largely influenced by you. Um, and I am so appreciative of that. I think you've exposed me to a lot of this that I may not have been exposed to otherwise. But to kind of define philosophy or what it means to me, it's it's really just trying to understand that there's very little in this life that we can control trying to understand our place in the world trying to understand that there's so many different ways to look at life and to look at almost every topic and so for me philosophy applies to like almost every facet of life you can look at it in a philosophical way meaning you're you're examining it with a critical mindset you're asking questions you're having a healthy level of skepticism about basically all information that you come across and question it and trying to determine what what's closest to the truth, if, if we can even get to the truth. So it's like analytically uh, dissecting whatever yeah. it is. Uh, that's a pretty robust, uh, complete answer, I think. I mean, that's pretty spot on for, you know, if you were to open up a philosophy textbook, that's, I mean, that's pretty, pretty on par, I think. And kind of, I, I mean, that's generally how I think of it as well, just... Again, kind of analyzing whatever it is. I agree with you. It's uh, sort of can be applied to anything, right? And you can sort of analyze whatever, you know, the best. Uh, and actually, I'll ask you about your parenting, uh, your philosophy regarding parenting, right? Or, you know, there's you know, philosophy on hiking and what times should you go up and how serious should you take weather considerations right. and so on. We've, I mean, in some sense, that's kind of, you know, ex expressing a philosophical take when you discuss that and you express your view, right? I For sure. I think the biggest thing that I've gotten, you know, talking with you so much over the last 20 some years is the questioning of information and not just believing everything and trying to have that critical mindset where you can think critically, analyze different facts like you were saying and problem solve. And that's one thing I try to instill in my children as well is like, don't just believe everything you hear, even if it's from a trusted authority like a An teacher. Expert. Yeah, I always like, hate how sometimes you have to have question so many that. appeals to the, the experts. And then we just I feel like so many times, you know, just trust and trust the trust the science. And I know there's some some sense to that, but like right. it's always like we make all these appeals to experts and then we don't actually think about it ourselves and use our actual experience sometimes. We just go with what right. 
And, uh, and I, I like how you're sort of suggesting, you know, part of the mentality of philosophy is like, you know, questioning things, right? I mean, that is sort of uh, the immediate sort of sort of inclination I have when it comes to philosophy is you, you aren't taking things at their face value. You're always sort of second guessing things. And I mean, it kind of sounds, it's not the best way to describe it, but like you're, you're not taking things at face value. You're, you're asking follow up questions, right? right? You're, you're not just going with what experts say. Granted, you know, part of being logical would be to factor in for sure what yeah. experts are saying and, you know, have that factor in. But, you know, you're always questioning things, whereas, I guess, people that aren't as immersed in philosophy, maybe that doesn't happen to them. Right. And I think a perfect example, sorry. This no, is, a perfect example of this is, so, Hannah and Parker's mom. We, we sometimes have this discussion back and forth about various things. Usually it revolves around what she's heard from a nurse friend, like, health-related issues, okay? So, like, my oldest daughter, Hannah, they they did a blood test once, and they said, oh, she's a little low on iron. So their mother immediately just said, well, my nurse friend said she needs to take these supplements, and, and that'll cure it. And I said, well, what about other avenues? Like, what about nutrition and trying to get more iron in her diet and looking at other ways to, instead of just taking a pill every day? But her mom's very much of the mindset, well, an expert, a nurse, one nurse I know, told me you should just take iron supplements and that'll cure everything. I'm, like, yeah, I'm not saying that she's necessarily like right. an and, idiot. And we probably all do that at times. Right. right. But, but you, that's just one small example that happens every day. Right, right. right. And ways. again, I think having a, a background in philosophy helps you, again, not just immediately go with those, right? You're always right. more more inclined to question things, I guess, yes. in general. So it kind of sounds we're all, like we're on the same page there. And again, probably because... A lot of your impressions of it was probably from from me. Yeah. Uh, okay. So, still in part two in terms of your philosophy back, background. Granted, you don't have a, a degree and you didn't even take a class per se. Um, we've had tons of uh, discussions, philosophical discussions throughout the years. In general, the question is, how philosophical would you say that you are? Um, I would say. I mean, again, using you as kind of my barometer, which I've done a lot over the years, is I, you're someone who's always kind of... I'm 100. Yeah, yeah. like you, you've always been good because you draw me further out of my comfort zone. Um, so yeah, if we if we look on a spectrum of 1 to 100, where Brad Muscle's 100, <laughs> I would say I'm, I'm on the upper end of that spectrum. I would probably put myself in like 60 to 70 range. Yeah, so you- um, better or not better, I shouldn't say, but more philosophical than the average. Okay. I, I think I question things and look into things and think deeper about things than the average. Person. And I think, in fairness, you know, philosophy isn't all great, right? I mean, there right. is, you know, I have this discussion in my intro classes. Once you take that pill, so to speak, and you become, you know, you start analyzing things, I think there's a sense in which you can do it maybe too much. And is ignorance bliss? I don't know. So we've had that talk. Before. Yeah, not to disparage, you know, um, so assuming that like philosophy is the pursuit of truth, and you're analyzing things to get 100% truth. Well, maybe that's a very painstaking process, right? And you won't be happier as a result. So maybe being, you know, on the scale of 100, where I guess I am, right? Always questioning everything. Maybe that's not the best place to be. Um, granted, maybe we don't want to be zero, where we just go with what everyone always tells us right. you know, without questioning anything. Who's to say, right? Um, where the perfect spot is. Yeah, and I think I probably float sometimes too high, as you just mentioned. I can think of numerous examples where I overanalyze things that are pretty trivial in the grand right, scheme of right. things. I and do I, it all the time, yeah. And I'll, like, hammer something home, like, well, logically, does that make sense? What do you... You get arguments for yes. it, and it's really something pretty minor. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I probably float sometimes too high and sometimes too low, so I agree with you. It's, it's kind of a moving target. I've also noticed the right that it's very... Um, like hard to jibe with or, you know, be real good friends or have real close relationships, I think, if you're very far apart on that spectrum. Because people that are questioning things all the time, I like to have these deep discussions. I've met people on that point off the end of the spectrum and they're like, just shut up. Where do we get, (laughs) where where are we getting with these endless questions, you know, just, so uh, I just thought that was an interesting, something that I thought about over the years too, that, um, you know, that there is that, there's definitely that spectrum and, uh, it seems like, uh, I don't know, like parties, for example. You know, some people, you have a few beers and then you start getting, getting philosophical. Some other people, most people maybe, that's the last thing you want to right. do. So yep. uh, definitely something that I've kind of grown to appreciate over the years. Um, so we said how philosophical you are. 
the follow-up then would be, what do you think of philosophy in general? I guess kind of how philosophical you are would maybe speak to that, but what, do you, what are your thoughts of philosophy in general? Yeah, I think you're right. It, it, the fact that I kind of view myself as a little above average in terms of being more philosophical speaks to the fact that I value it, yeah. and I think there's, there's a lot of benefit to having that kind of mentality. And again, as we just mentioned, there's a time and place where you need to be a little more and a little less, mm -hmm. but I think there's a huge value and a huge benefit to having that in our society. Um, and I think some of the advances we've made as a species over thousands of years, you can probably trace a lot of that back to being philosophical. Right, for sure. And having that mindset of, critically thinking and questioning things and why not this and why are we doing it this and way realizing there's other possibilities. exactly so i think just that general umbrella of philosophy has been hugely beneficial to our culture and our species and our evolution so why don't we have more philosophers then i think there's a lot of effort so to give credit where credit is due people who are dedicated to philosophy who have studied it and who pursue that, that is a lot of mental effort. And I can say from my own experience, not studying it near as much and not putting as much energy into it, I know even the little amount I've done, the mental effort and energy that goes into that can be taxing. And it also can be, I think, at times almost demoralizing. Right, can, when you don't get any answers. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it almost feels futile at times. And so for people who continue to pursue it, even though it's like you never seem to reach that ultimate truth, that is commendable and i think not enough people do it because it takes so much energy okay, and that's a difficult process yeah. yeah interesting all right so the last i think this is the last yeah oh maybe there's two here oh okay so second to last part of the our question of this part uh who is your favorite philosopher of all time and so maybe you know you haven't studied it that much can you name a philosopher if you don't have a, a favorite of all time i mean i can name a couple i don't know if I can say I Besides have a So let's go top three. You, you actually have like I don't have favorites, okay. to be honest. I couldn't I wouldn't be able to say like, oh yeah, this is the one. <laughs> but I, I know some Kant, uh, Socrates. So these are names you've heard. Yeah. Okay. And I've read certain things from them. Um, based on your recommendations, I've read a few um, books by different philosophers, and I even read a book that was like a compilation of a few of the most famous philosophers and their viewpoints on major topics. Um, you mentioned Kant. I think that's mm -hmm. interesting because he's not one of the necessarily more well-known ones. You so. definitely put me onto him. Okay. The only reason I I'm actually not a big fan of his. I'm surprised that. But I know you've <laughs> talked that, about though. him and and mentioned his name and, and inspired me to look more into him. Kant, Socrates, Brad Muscle. Brad Muscle. Okay, that's a good. Yeah. I like that uh, that group. So, are there last question to this part? Are there any particular areas of philosophy that you would say interest you the most? I mean, I would say early on in being introduced to philosophy with discussions with you, the religious aspect was most interesting to me and most enlightening because I grew up as a Catholic, like born as a Catholic, was an altar boy went to Catholic Church, was very much indoctrinated into Catholicism. And by the time I was maybe a junior and senior in high school, I was questioning some of it, like, oh, what, why, why are we doing this? Like, it seems odd. It doesn't really make sense. But at a very minor level, and by the time I got to college and met you, you just, like, blew my mind mm -hmm. with the questions you were asking. And the thing I always appreciated about, I think, almost all of our discussions we've had over the years is you – question a person without making them feel stupid and i think that's the sign of a, a good philosopher is you're able to like pose a question back to the person and get them thinking without making them feel like oh you're such an idiot Why well i appreciate you? you saying that but sometimes i actually feel like it's the opposite like i've, I've heard that i'm intimidating and like people want to stop I mean, discussing you know, i mean i think your knowledge and your expertise some people could be intimidated by the fact oh my gosh this guy knows everything about philosophy like but I think you do it in a way, again, my my perception of it was you just asked so many questions that made me stop and be like, wait, yeah, why did I think that? Why do I believe yeah, that? So to me, the most interesting aspect of philosophy, at least back then, now maybe not so much, but religion was definitely a huge one because it just really got me thinking. And it wasn't so much that like, okay, I talked to Brad, 
he asked me a bunch of questions and now I don't believe in anything. Now I don't believe right. in God. Now, but it really helped me, I think, shape my views and it helped me kind of come into my own. It wasn't that I just like mimicked exactly what you believe. You helped me kind of discover what it is I truly believe and what made most sense to me. Right. Instead of just accepting what we were told from the beginning, kind of right. going back to what we were talking about before, you at least started questioning it a little bit more, maybe had uh, more of a justification if you kept certain beliefs. Right. Whereas maybe before it was just blind faith or something like that. Exactly. I also think it's interesting. I was just reflecting on this recently. How I wonder if it's true for a lot of us in terms of what's most interesting philosophically if it is kind of age dependent because the same thing for me it was a lot of philosophy and religion stuff was of utmost significance for me about that that age um, and then maybe that's because so many of us grow up you know under our parents' wings in certain ways and you know we just are at that age then we just start questioning that right. right? Uh, and a lot of us, we don't, for better or worse, probably for worse, I would argue, we don't have a choice over that growing up, right? right. So you're, uh, you're going to start questioning it when you reach the age of reason or... Right, which is reason. why I always am hypercritical of myself when it comes to parenting my kids. And I'm always trying to be cognizant of, am I just like funneling them down okay. the way I believe and not allowing them to see other viewpoints? So I try to make like an actual persistent effort and be proactive and be like, okay, here's what I think, but there's other viewpoints out there. Right. Mine isn't necessarily right when it comes to politics, religion, whatever it is. And I know I, I still fall short with that, but I think it's important because just like you said, so many times kids literally just are indoctrinated into yeah. whatever their parents say. That's what they believe. And, and at a young age, that's fine. What else? I mean, it seems like that's maybe just the only way it can be, but I feel like at a certain age, whatever that is, but before 18, I think, you can start to introduce your kids to other ways of thinking and let them start to figure it out on their own. Right. And there is, that's part of parenting. I think we all like to think maybe we're objective when we raise them, but how, you know how many of us are. Yeah. yeah you know there's got to be. And I think, you know, part of maybe being a good parent is pre at least having that in mind. Granted, you're still going to probably steer them in certain ways. Yes. At least if you're more aware of that that's happening, maybe it won't be as much, right? Right. And they'll have a little bit more freedom in that sense. So, okay, so granted, um, at least you and maybe generally people in general uh, were most interested in philosophy religion at that age. Is there anything more recently that you're more interested in now? I mean, I think the, the thing that's probably been most intriguing to me the last, say, five years is the idea of control, uh, destiny, fate, mm -hmm. how much of our lives are we actually manipulating or is it all just out of our hands and it's all playing out and it's just a matter of circumstances and our environment and our DNA, things we have zero control over. And we've had this discussion. To say, this is probably the most reoccurring uh, discussion that we've had over decades. I yes. Mean, we've had, we've covered the gamut probably in terms of philosophical topics throughout the years, but that is one that we always seem to revisit and, uh, and we'll actually kind of get extra. I'm going to save our, our thoughts on that because okay? that's actually that's a good segue to move into part three. Then where we'll talk about the big questions, and that's going to be one of them okay. is whether we're free or ultimately everything's determined. So let's start with the the first big one. This is the one that got me going. Why is there something and not nothing? And in, um, I learned my lesson in episode one where. Uh, with Jamie, where you know, ultimately the answer would be, I don't know. And so, <laughs> fair enough, right? I mean, I think part of philosophy is getting you to realize that you don't know on a lot of this stuff, right? But right. So granted, maybe you don't have the answer, think you know 100%, like where would you lean? So why is there something and not nothing? Why is, does reality exist? Yeah, I mean, I think over the years, I've really, I mean, I've changed and pivoted on this numerous times, to be honest. So you know, growing up, obviously it was God. I was taught God and, and God created everything. And without God, there was nothing before him. And then, you know, I moved into college and I start having discussions with Brad Muscle and I start to question things a little bit. And I think, well, maybe, hmm, maybe not. Maybe there's other ways. And I'm, then because of Brad, I'm inspired to read up more on my own and start reading about other things like that I had never even been exposed to in school, which was unfortunate, but like the Big Bang Theory and other right. things. And so then I started to float into like maybe agnostic where it's like, well, 
I don't know. I'm not necessarily saying there isn't a God, but I don't know for sure if there is one. And then I even feel like I floated into atheism where I was like, there definitely isn't a God. There's no way. That doesn't make sense. I think now where I've landed finally, and not to say this won't shift, because I always feel like I, I can move again and evolve. I think there is ultimately a higher being. I don't think it's necessarily the way it's portrayed in maybe the Christian Bible. Um, but I think there's a higher being that that had to have like started something. It, it still doesn't make sense to me. I still can't make Because you know the next question. Right. Like where the higher being right. came from. Right. Like how, how did this being come into existence? But ultimately, I think this is one of those questions where, yeah, you, you're not going to get to the source answer. There's no way. Right. Because without the higher being, how did this one particle come into existence? So I, I've landed on right now where I currently sit is there is a higher being. And and I don't know how that higher being came into existence, but that's what started. Wow, that's really interesting because, I mean, we're sort of very similar path. Again because, I mean, well, actually, you started religious. Yeah. I probably started more or less as, I don't know if I was ever an atheist, but agnostic for yeah. sure. And then sort of end up um, sort of rejecting it more and more. But then as years went on, kind of appreciating, well, I don't know, like, even with the Big Bang, like again, how does how does all uh, right. it doesn't explain why there's something and not nothing? I mean, uh, so I've come back, kind of where so where you are. I think that there has to be something out outside or that we that explains the creation, uh, but but to specify any more than that, like that's as far as I kind of yeah. You know, I don't you know. So for for me, it's an important distinction is being religious versus. Being spiritual, I would 100%, say, I agree. and that's I guess we're both spiritual now, and that yeah. twenty years ago it would have been weird kind of for me to hear myself describe myself that that way. Right. But um, so maybe spiritual, and not necessarily religious. And so I don't know. That's interesting that we're both there. Yeah. As well. Question two: What's the meaning of life, or why? Why are we here? So again, I think I really like evolved over time with this and again i i always leave the the door open that i could evolve my thoughts on this even more um which is one thing i've always not always but one thing i've really tried to pride myself on in the last 20 years is always being open to completely changing my views on something i never want to be stuck in one place where i'm like yes i believe this and you'll never change my mind no matter what you tell me um but right now i would say i've landed on for me it's being able to bring happiness or improve others' lives in some way. Interesting. So I feel like so many times people say, the cliche answer a lot of times is to be happy, to find happiness, right? So what's the meaning of life? To be happy, find happiness in some way. To me, it's more about, and maybe this isn't so much the meaning of life. I guess maybe I'm kind of uh, blurring the lines here. More the purpose of life for me, is to somehow bring happiness to others. Oh, no, that's, that's definitely different than the usual, you know, find happiness. So you, I was like, instantly when you started describing it, that was like, remind me of like the idea of Christian charity or like helping. Yeah. Uh, so you think that that is um, ultimately what life's about is, is not just pursuing. So I guess not even necessarily pursuing your happiness with that. Right. That's not a, necessarily an ingredient in helping others, but helping others. Right. Now, what made you come to that? Well, I think a big part of it was having kids. And so I know that for me, before I had any kids, I I don't know what I would have said to this question, to be honest. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I felt kind of lost and kind of like I didn't have much direction in life um, when my first daughter was born when Hannah was born, things really changed for me in terms of my mindset. And I really decided that my life and my existence even was not as important as hers. And I think a lot of parents probably feel that similar thing. I'm not saying I'm unique in that. Um, but I know that after my first daughter was born, I, I kind of struggled with some depression issues and, and struggled with some things. And I firmly believe to this day that having her in my life and pouring my energy and effort into making her happy and trying to better her life saved my life and, and kept me here. And as I thought about that more over the years and, and I had two more children after that, 
I, I just came to the conclusion that when I am at my best and when I feel the best, it's when I'm pouring myself into them. When I'm filling them up with happiness and I'm doing everything I can to try to better their life, and not just them, but others around me, I feel the best and I feel like I'm successful and, and my energy is in the right place. And, and so it just helps align everything for me. Well, that's interesting because that kind of comes full circle then. Even if you are interested in happiness, it's I'm getting the idea that to become, you were the happiest helping. Uh, right. Others. So it's almost like indirectly right. it is pursuing my own happiness by making right. them happy. But my ultimate goal is to make them happy. Right. It's not because yeah, some people like a hedonist might say, well, you were actually still trying right. to fulfill your own uh, a pleasure but uh right it's like when people like they go volunteer because they say it makes them happy it's like well are you doing it for the right reason? right right you really right. should be volunteering to help the other person so i'm kind of in that same like loop <laughs> but i firmly believe i am even if i didn't get happiness out of it i still believe that's the purpose is to make them happy and make others around me happy. well i think i mean not to get too personal but you know where you were before and then where you were after you started helping presumably more right when you right. had the kids i mean that speaks to me that that there is something to that, that yeah that helping others really does make us happier yeah you know? for or, me yeah maybe there's something to well it's one thing to help your kids versus others you know are they really others if they're right. your kids but i mean i still think it kind of speaks to something there that there's something we glean or gain from you know not just being so self-absorbed right helping you know, being willing to to assist others Anything more on that? That's, wow, that's you have some great answers. Like, and I, I stressed to him before. Right? Don't rehearse. <laughs> he had watched episode one, but it's been a long time ago. Right. Right. Uh, a year ago when you guys first. Put it so out. you watched it right away. Yeah. So I mean, you probably although you have a way better memory than me, but so you probably remembered some of that stuff. But I mean, I can't believe how developed some of your answers are. I mean, are you sure you haven't done philosophy before? You've practiced. You have You've some books out there. You've trained me. Okay. And I should, should mention uh, the background. We actually climbed, I don't know if you can see it in the video, but uh, the Mount Elbert. Uh, Elbert. Elbert. We have so many. We're doing three this week. Uh, Mount Elbert is actually viewable from our, our place here. So uh, great uh, scenery here. We're really enjoying it. Let's move on to question three here of the big questions. Does morality exist? So this is shifting gears quite a bit. Does morality exist and how do we figure it out if it does? Does morality exist? Ooh, is he stumped for once? He doesn't I am have... a little. So meaning, like, is there some sort of ingrained, it's like in all of our DNA that we just have this moral code? Well, not necessarily that. So morality, there's a proper way or certain ways we ought to behave. Okay. Right. So taking that to be what morality means, do you believe there really is a certain, whether um, that's something to do with uh, our evolution and survival or, you know, whether it's sort of founded in that or if there's some other foundation for morality i guess that would be gotcha. the second part of the question and be right so does morality exist do you really think there is a certain or proper way that we ought to behave or at least in certain situations maybe maybe right. situational and then if you do think there is a right way to behave you know how is it that we come to that so that would be then that's that. such a good question I feel like we haven't discussed this one. Yes, ever. we haven't gone into this one as much. So, because, okay, so my first thoughts are to think of us as human beings, animals that, you know, have existed for thousands of years. And the first thing that comes to mind is survival. Okay. Before we have civilization, I mean, our utmost goal, I'm guessing, back... Stay alive. Right. And so, if you have that as your ultimate goal morality kind of gets pushed to the wayside right because you're going to do whatever it takes to survive well maybe morality is a tool to survive maybe it's the most important thing right Con getting people to at least believe that there is a right way to behave right okay to not hurt others to not steal their stuff True. right and then you will actually keep your bananas keep your resources True. i don't know so that's I, okay that's see I this is why you're so good at this you get me to think about different angles see i was going from the angle of like survival of the fittest like if i can if I can kill you to take right. your food, then I'll make sure that survive. And that's not what we associate with morality. Hence, right. setting it aside with survival is the most important right. thing. Right. But long term, I mean, I think just the evolution of our culture and our species speaks to the fact that there, that morality was beneficial. Because we obviously, as you just alluded to, we slowly but surely instituted some of these moral codes along the way, which allowed society to flourish and continue. So... 
I, I think there's benefit to morality, obviously. Should, man, this is a tough one. I know. <laughs> I, I think I'll say this, and this isn't a great answer. I think morality should exist, and I think morality, unfortunately, probably mostly came from religion in terms of what we view as morality now. I think a lot of it came from religion, and I think we've adapted it in certain ways, and now we don't necessarily need the religion part of it because I think it's been ingrained in, in most of our society, some of these principles. I think back then, in defense of religion, way back when, I think they they created a lot of these structures and rules regarding their religion because of this, right? To try to get a moral code in place. And it was like, how do we get people to go along with this? Well, let's put the fear into them. Right. If you don't follow this moral code, you're going to burn in hell or you'll have some sort of consequences in the right. afterlife. And so they put all these rules and all this fear of consequences in the afterlife to get people to go along with it. Right. So it was a fear technique to kind of instill it initially. Um, I don't think we need that anymore. I think they're, they, we've evolved enough as a society and a culture that we can say there are certain moral codes in place and we should continue with those. Yeah, and, sure. and we don't need the religion to come in and scare everyone and say, oh, well, if you don't do this, you're going to go to hell. I think saying you should do this because it's the right thing to do or because it makes someone else happy or because it's going to benefit someone else. Um, so I didn't really answer that question very well. But No, we got into like, um, you know, maybe it's in place because it helps us survive or whether religion was part of that or not. And I think that that's one thing, right? Um, and getting people to believe there is such a thing as morality, that there is get them to believe that they ought to behave certain ways, right? But so that's one thing and whether that's efficacious and will get you certain practical results, that's one thing. But then is there actually a right way to behave, right? Right. It's one thing to discuss the benefits of getting everyone to right. believe there's a right way to behave, but is there really a certain proper way to behave? And see, that's what takes me back to like the animal part of us, that ultimately we're, we're animals, we're higher evolved animals than the other species on this planet, but is there a moral code with other animals? Yeah. I Not mean, really, right? I mean, from what we can Some observe. species, it might be a little nuanced, but I think in general, yeah, I mean, nothing approaching what we would call morality. I don't right. Think. So, so I don't know. I, I think I want to say yes, but I my instinct tells me that I'm saying yes because of all the influences I've had right. from religion and society that I live in. And it helps us survive. And right. Us survive. And so I'm so used to it and so ingrained in me that, oh, yeah, there is a moral code. This is the right way to do things. Right. But if you pick me up and transport me to some other planet, would I still believe that same thing or be like, oh, yeah, we didn't need all that moral and code. maybe and... your survival wasn't insured and you really had to go back to this, right. you know, where you needed to fight for your survival. I mean, maybe you wouldn't be as inclined to refrain from taking other people's resources, right, if you were going to – Right. On um, the verge of peril. So, all right. So we got into some interesting uh, tangents there on the, the morality. This is the one uh, we alluded to before. So are we ultimately free – or determined. So oh, I was going to go, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, my recollection is most of our discussions, I would argue, tend to argue the determinist side and you tended to push against that. Is that right? So does it, yes. is it safe to say, I mean, and that that's based on past discussions. So can I safely infer then, can we, that you think that we're ultimately free? We do have. Choice? So. Again, I'm, I won't give you the best answer because I'm going to float in the middle. I, I don't think we're 100% free. I think there's definitely some aspects of your side of things that are totally true, that where we are born, our DNA, who our parents were, um, all, all kinds of factors, right, are helping determine and influence how our lives play out. I hesitate to go like a full, yes, 100%. We have zero control. We have zero choice. Everything is just happening to us, and we are at the mercy of... Because it's scary? Is that why you hesitate? That's part of it. And part of it is, admittedly, I'm a control freak. I'm very much... I have like you ever control. had control, though? How can you be a control freak if you have no right. control? I try very hard to be a control freak. Um, so I like... The idea, to your point, I, it makes me feel better 
thinking there, we do have a little bit of control. So we're 90% determined, let's say, about 10% we have still choices that present themselves to us that we're going to make. Now, you could say when you make those choices, it's because your brain has been wired a certain way because of the influences and your experiences. And that's what helps you make that decision. So you're not really making right. a decision. And I get what you're saying and what that argument is. Um, and I have this discussion with my kids all the time. I just had a discussion with the other day because one of my kids was talking about kind of complaining, not super bad, but complaining about a circumstance in their life. And so I did one of my, they call them dad life lessons, which turned into a long talk. Harry and Flossie Method on parenting. Remind me of this one. (laughs) So my dad life lessons tend to kind of draw out, but it's it's similar to our discussions. I like to bring up different things for them to think about. And so I said to them, okay, I understand you think this is hard, but let's say that you aren't living in Nebraska and you're not a kid who lives in basically a white kind of privileged society and you don't have all these advantages and you don't go to school and you don't have parents that are relatively successful and are able to provide house and clothes. Let's take you out of all this and put you somewhere else. Now, how bad does this inconvenience seem to you? Given that now you're in a completely different environment, you look at life completely different to you. Important things are not video games and iPad and snacks. Important things are how am I going to survive? Am I going to be in danger tomorrow? So, yeah, I, I would be, every one of us would be completely different people in theory if we were born in a different place, had different parents. So I totally get that argument about being like, you know, life is determined and these choices aren't really our choices. And admittedly, I'm probably holding on to this out of just like false hope and being naive, but I hold on to it a little bit. That's, I mean, it's, it is, the truth might not, might not be pretty. I mean, and as a parent, it's, I mean, if you actually are deterministic, how do you ever hold your kids responsible? Right. I mean, in some sense, like, and this is actually how I think about things sometimes. If there's this certain behavior that's bad on their part, I mean, I think, well, then what have I done to sort of lead to this behavior on their part? They probably watched something that I did, right? Right. And they're imitating some bad behavior or habit that I did to begin with, right? So I'm always tracing it back in that sort of deterministic way. Right. And in some sense, then, it, on the flip side is, do they get out of things then, right? Because you, how do you hold people responsible if they, right? They everything they did is determined by and all these factors. Not only holding others responsible, but holding yourself accountable. Yeah. I think for me, part of it is I want to hold myself accountable to things I view as my own mistakes and shortcomings, and constantly look to improve and have like a growth mindset of I can do better, I can do better. And I think if I allow myself to be a hundred percent on the deterministic side maybe I lose that edge a little bit. And I'm like, well, am I going to really make a difference? Some sort of fatalistic. I'm yeah. Like, what? like, what's it worth putting all this effort into trying to improve myself? As is it human? really my effort? I mean, yeah. So I think part of it is, you know, being a control freak, thinking I have control, wanting control, if I can have any at all. And what you talked about holding others and myself accountable and wanting to improve. And I like the idea at least of, yes, I can make efforts and I can make changes to improve myself and, and be a better person tomorrow than I was today. Hence, I actually do have control. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> to be continued to for be us continued. forever, yeah. probably. Yeah. I guess it depends on you know, uh, what happens and how we're conditioned from this point forward. <laughs> but this is what I appreciate, sidebar. Mm-hmm. I, I think there's been numerous topics where we agree for the most part. Right, there's numerous topics sure, we talk, yeah. and 90 percent we we agree probably in some range we're kind of in the same ballpark. There's other topics like this one, and there's been others where we disagree. Right, and we can both even be fairly passionate about the disagreement. But I, I speaking to you again, credit to you, you're so good at not making me feel like oh you're such well, an idiot. Josh. Again, I wonder if that's because we're both on that end of the spectrum, and if yeah, but I think there's be- been other issues where we're even further apart. Right. And you do a good job of just allowing. I'm saying to... the spectrum of how philosophical we are. Yes. Okay. I got so you. we can have those intense debates, right? And they don't um, irritate us like they would with the person that doesn't want to get into those things. As right. Much. And, yeah. And I think that speaks to, again, like what you're saying, that, that mindset, philosophical mindset, and also just the, the dynamic, flexible mindset of, I don't think... I won't speak for you, but for me, I don't think there's any major topic where I'm like 
hundred percent dead set. I will never change my mind. There's yeah. nothing in my lifetime, no evidence, no information you can show me. I'll never change my mind on this topic. I always feel like I'm able to be swayed a little bit on any topic. Interesting. Would yeah. you say the same thing or no? Probably. I mean, I think, don't you, that goes back to being open, right? Other, right. I mean, because what would that say if you thought you were 100%? Like, there's nothing possible that convinced you other. So I would say I'm the same. Like, there are certain things, obviously, that I'm maybe uh, feel stronger about. But, right. like, yeah, I mean, I'm always open. And, again, that's kind of the upshot of a lot of uh, my philosophical pursuits is the realization that, man, not only do I not know things, but maybe a lot of times what I thought was right is for sure not. So, right. Um, yeah, I mean, that just clues me into uh, how little I, I really truly know and that I should be flexible and open to being wrong on virtually everything. So yeah. We're in the same boat uh, there. Um, okay, so last of the big questions. Okay. And it kind of, I mean, somewhat related to some of these other discussions, but what's really happening? What's going on? Or is this a simulation? Uh, are we, is this actually a long dream? Is this uh, what happens, you know, at the end of our life? Some people say that you sort of relive everything. I don't know. Are we reincarnated? Or were we animals before? What, what's happening? Right. I mean, you know, my ultimate answer is going to be, don't I don't know. know. Right. <laughs> but I'll talk it through. Where are you I, leaning? I'm, I like this stuff. I, I think it's interesting because we were talking about this the other day, that we're fairly certain as a species that we have so much untapped potential in our brains, right? Right. That we are probably not able to see, compute, experience everything that's going on in what we consider the real world, right? right? So there's so much that I think most people would agree that, man, we just don't know a lot. We really right. don't know a lot about what's going on. So for me to say like, well, what's really going on is this. We're living beings, we're existing, we die, and then depend, yeah, depending on where you fall on the religious spectrum, you, you that's it, just curtains down, nothing mm -hmm. else, your, your existence ceases, and no more thought, brains dead, or other people say you go on to some afterlife. I, I tend to think there is something more going on. Okay. That this isn't, we're not, we're not able to see everything. We're, there's definitely something behind the curtain, and we're not able to peek behind it for the most part. I, I think that, uh, I think it's possible, though, that over the years, we'll discover more. I'm confident that existence, say 200 years from now, they will understand more about what is really going like on. Like in terms of our, the fundamental existence questions? Yes. Yes. Interesting. What well, makes you think that? Because we've had how many millions? Of... Yeah, I mean, I think, one, I think that science continues to evolve, understanding how we can access different points of the brain, how we can tap into cognitive abilities. I, I just think that for me, it's less of a spiritual thing, this kind of talk. Mm. And it's more of a science based and figuring out what's possible with the right. brain. And, and I think the more that we can understand how the brain works and the more that we can understand how the world works and how we fit into it, I think we'll have a better understanding of our existence and maybe even why we're here and what we're supposed to be doing here. And I think it's very separate from like the spiritual aspect of it. Well, it's, I mean, maybe this is to the spiritual aspect, but like I was going to say, then what is death? I mean, is it, I think you were kind of saying, well, there may be something more like, uh, so when we die here, uh, is that completely it curtains down or, uh, and that's a good question too. And it's not necessarily like if you say no, I don't think that. It doesn't mean you're, you know, you give the religious answer where, right. where we go to heaven or hell or something like that. It could be, you know, maybe we are uh, uh, awakened then to some other dimension or you know consciousness or something like that. So right, I would say to be honest, I'm mostly fall on the side of that's just it. Okay. I think that what's happening inside of us is is a very complex, chemical, 
biological thing. And when this is no longer functioning, I don't necessarily think that we somehow then have consciousness or awareness somewhere else. I think that for the most part, the way I see it is we've all been kind of indoctrinated. Again, going way back, religion really helped push this, obviously. But I think part of it also is we as humans are really just hoping, right? right. We're hoping that there's more after this. We just That's so final otherwise. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's just in our nature to be like, when we die, yeah, there's got to be something after that, right? There's got to be. Right. But I think that's maybe just wishful thinking, and that's just kind of our human nature to want something else and not have that finality. It's, okay. Uh, so it's interesting that you lean that way. And before when we discussed, like, uh, is there something outside? You said something like uh, there's something more, you think, in the spiritual. Yeah. Uh, but so you have that idea that there's um, – there is some sort of, you know, you're not pegging down an essence for God. But there's some sort of spiritual explanation for what's going on. Right. So you're saying that. And at the same time, though, when we die here, that's it. Right. Interesting. So um, there's something else immaterial or outside of our traditional scientific right. um, thinking. But it seems like, nevertheless, your approach to death is in line with the t- typical, I guess, scientific. Right. Um, perspective, and I, I, I'm probably way over generalizing there. I mean, granted, but but yeah, but no, that's I mean, that's I would agree that kind of summarizes what I would think about that. Interesting, okay, so man, we unraveled a lot there in uh, part three. Part four is where we get to know uh, what Josh thinks about some of his well, uh, questions that are more specific to him. So these are things that I kind of thought about that, uh, reflect again you in particular so and you'll you'll uh you'll like some of these so we've often had conversations where uh you'll ask me where i'd move if i could yeah and what's interesting is uh, another friend of mine dave i mentioned him yeah he just asked me the same ironically the same question a couple weeks ago so we had this long extended discussion about it and it reminded me he he does so much of what he does and says reminds me of you it's interesting um, but so let's revisit that. Where would you move if you could move anywhere? And what are the driving or essential factors or most important factors when you answer that and are in your decision there? So, yeah, I've thought about this a lot. I, cause you've asked me that this a yes, lot. I feel like we've talked about this a lot. Yeah. I, first of all, admittedly, I'm fairly naive when it comes to other places to live. I have not traveled a lot. Yeah. We're so, like opposites there. Yeah. You, you definitely have more experience with these places. So I, I was trying to caution myself like, Oh, I'll definitely move there without knowing anything right, about right. it. Never been there. Don't know the people. So I, I admittedly maybe don't know all of the factors and all the information I would have to do some research, but just first surface level, I would say Australia sticks out to me as somewhere I'd love to go. One climate. <laughs> I like warm climates. Um, I hate Nebraska winters. So Australia seems like a great climate for me. It seems like an interesting place in terms of landscape, wildlife, by the ocean. Um, Also, not to get too political, but I'm kind of sick and tired of the U.S. political system. It's it's disgusting to me. I'm very much repulsed by it. And again, not to say that Australia doesn't have its own political shortcomings, and I'm sure they have things that would be annoying as well. But to me, America is like epitomizing what's wrong with politics. And so getting away from that is is a huge <laughs> benefit for me. So Australia comes to mind um, as my first choice. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think if I were to answer this, I, the government would actually be the number one factor, I think. Yeah. What government is in place. And in my humble opinion, unfortunately, I think they're all very similar at this point. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that you can really escape a lot of the same issues that we're confronted with here, um, corruption and so on. I think it's pretty much uh, almost everywhere. Um, I guess it's just a matter of what's the least egregious, maybe. Right. (laughs) Uh, So it sounded like climate and then maybe a little less uh, ridiculous government. Yeah, yeah. Okay, fair enough. So do you have any other besides Australia? Um, Number two. I don't know. I always just remember you saying Australia, too. Yeah, Australia is just like the one that sticks out the most. I don't know. So when you retire, that's where you're going to go? Hopefully. Okay. Yeah, see, Europe, you know, you're saying, like, 
governments around the world. And, and for the most part, I think you're right. But Europe for sure screams that to me. Like Europe's government and politics seem to, for the most part, the countries that I've looked into, seems to very much mirror what we have going on here. And yeah, so, where can you go? That's I issue. know. I mean... Maybe I used, some like desolate place and some like jungle, but I used to think highly of Canada. I'm scared of what's happening uh, recently uh, there as well. So yeah, uh, yeah. I, so climate though and the government is part of it. Then for you too, yeah, that would be completely. I think actually, I think of climate would be important too. So I would say the two same two things probably, but flip them. Okay. Yeah. So, so. where are you going? I don't know where I can go. I think uh, it's <laughs> too late, man. It's uh, ever, it's corrupt everywhere. It's reached a tipping point where Gotta nowhere find, is good. Find somewhere where money is not in politics, and yeah. hence nowhere. That's tough. Uh, so I don't know, and it's another thing like how feasible is it even? You know? Right. But granted, you know, in, in theory, where would I like to go? I, I did like Australia. I mean, so I went there a long time ago. You know, when I was a kid, I remember really liking it. We spent a lot of time there. Uh, I just remember thinking they were like two decades behind us in terms of fashion and so on. Everybody was super nice and loved the like the climate, like you were uh, talking about. There's different um, different sort of geographical areas, of, you know, that had different appeals for different reasons. And right. uh, so I was, I'm definitely on board with Australia, uh, I guess, if I had to pick. All so, right, 20 years. Man. we're going. So our <laughs> We 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 seem to agree on a lot of this, except except for that uh, free will one. Yes. That's the one that's um, sticking out here. So, moving on to the second one. So you mentioned how you've been uh, working, you know, at the bank for for decades now, right? Mm -hmm. So, I guess I would be curious to hear sort of your just general observations, if you have any, about people when money's involved. So you know through discussions again how. Uh, how I've reflected a lot on money and have certain views and sort of wonder. And then the general question is money, the root of all evil right. people discuss that. So, you know, you have a lot of experience with around people uh, when money's involved. And so I don't know if you have any like, crazy stories or if you've seen general like tendencies when it comes to people, when it comes to money or anything like that. I mean, I think for me, like working in the bank for 20 plus years, I, I don't necessarily think people, the general public coming into the bank, behave uniquely from the general public going into a Walmart or McDonald's, um, which unfortunately to me, <laughs> the perception is the general public is typically very rude, very selfish, very very much inconsiderate so of no, just other human beings. No better treatment when right. money's involved. Yeah, I don't think they, they act any better or worse okay. in the banking world. Um, I definitely agree with you in terms of, you know, money and greed. You can usually, like, it all dovetails back to that, right? Like, it's most of the problems we have in this world, you can trace it back ultimately to money being at the stem of that. I think the interesting thing I noticed though, working at a bank is most people that I talk to, and I'm not saying you, but most people I talk to, they tend to have this perception of, oh, bank is like high class and people coming in are probably like wearing business suits and very polite and shaking hands and making big deals. And it's like at the branch level of banking, retail banking, it's no different than Walmart. Those people coming in, we get some of the nastiest people, some of the meanest people, some of the rudest people, they come in yelling and screaming. I remember I had a one guy who literally wanted to fist fight me. Oh, yeah, fist fight. Wow. This guy was like 80 years old at the time. Oh, my goodness. And I remember this vividly because I told my kids about the story, and they were just, like, mortified. But he came in. He needed to order checks. Told them that they would be, like, $25 for a box of checks. And he screamed and lost his mind, said that he's been banking there since before I was born. He should get his checks for free. Why should he have to pay for them? He's kept his accounts here. On and on and on. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry, sir. This is, you know, we charge for checks. We don't give them away for free. And ultimately, he got to the point where he said, I don't care. I'll fight you right now. Come out here. Let's oh go. We'll and so, oh, wow. I mean, that's just one small little snippet. But that gives you an indication of that's not the only. And that's just over $25. Yeah. Oh so, I mean, we've had people lose their mind over all kinds of things. So, in terms of... Yeah, I agree with you. Money causes problems in so many different ways. But I think I think for these people, 
a lot of times, like, you look at that guy, and I'm interested in what you would say. Because I remember thinking about this afterwards and analyzing, like, is it really the $25? Like, is it really, you know, oh, I can't afford $25? Or is it more like the power and the respect and the prestige and he feels like I should bow down to him and I should give in and he wants to have that kind of arrogance of I'm better than you and I should get this for free I mean this guy had like thousands and thousands of dollars not the money then yeah so I agree with you for sure that money we can trace all most problems if not all back to money but in that situation I kind of feel like there's there's a lot to that I mean I think there's a lot of other things going on there besides just the money. The $25 to me didn't seem like his big problem. It was more about he felt he was owed something, respect, power, me groveling to him, whatever it is. What are your thoughts? I don't know if it's about them. And maybe that gives them, right, if, if they can sort of push their convictions and, and solidify that, right, that gives them a sense of power. Maybe right. that is it. And that's what you mean by power. Then. Yeah. Because, yeah. okay, you were, you were a waiter back in the day. Right, you were a server. You worked at a restaurant. Right. I'm sure you came across horrible situations too. People treating you terrible, and oh, like, yeah. you know, let's say like, oh, their burger was undercooked, or you know, you didn't bring their beer fast enough, and then they stiff you on the tip. Is that really about the money for them? Is that, or is that just them being kind of an a hole because they want to hold something over you? And, they right. and they're not even going to remember it a week, every two weeks later. Right. You know? So. Yeah. In those situations, it's interesting to me what is going on. Like the psychology of that is very right. interesting. Like, what is their motivator to being so cruel to someone else? Yeah, I don't, I don't get it. But on, I think we should repeat what you said earlier, though. At the same time, you do get really good customers, yes, right, and uh, who presumably never argue about For sure. their policies that you can't ever For do sure. anything about anyway, right? Yes. But yes, yeah, I don't know why is it that, and we all encounter these situations when we. You know, we have disagreements. And then when the person is just such a jerk about right. it, though, like, what, how are you? Again, it comes back to, to sort of philosophy. And I think if you have more of a philosophical mindset, you're not as likely to do that sort of thing. I are agree. you? Because you're you're more inclined to think, well, maybe, you know, there, there's a there's a point that he has, right? Or right. Entertain these other possibilities. I, mean, I used to think, and I used to even say this as like, Oh, if I could be president and if I could make one rule, you know, those weird discussions. Right. I used to say everyone should have to work in retail because the, the thought was, and this is kind of cliche. People have said this before. It wasn't my idea. If everyone had to work in retail and they had to experience that, they wouldn't treat others that way. Right. But I don't think that's true because I've seen so many people right. that have worked in retail and then they'll come in and act like a total right. piece of crap. And again, they just have the certain ways of viewing it. Uh, and I think it goes back to what you said. I think they're – how they view the world, bigger picture. Like, do they General, look at the world more yeah. open-minded and are able to be flexible and say, oh, well, this didn't work out for me, but what are the reasons why? Maybe this person had nothing to do with it, as opposed to the person who's like, oh, this isn't right. Who's the first person I can yell at? And go back to the, the guy. I mean, at least real, and maybe it would help him realize that you had, didn't have any control over it. Right. What can you even do? Even if he's right. Right. right? I mean, it takes a certain kind of person to like then so be so adamant and threaten to fight someone who has no control over right. it, who literally couldn't do anything, and you, you can't you can't say okay free right. You don't have that power. Or right. That. So uh, yeah, if only so he must have been a a zero on the spectrum, or in terms of the tendencies. <laughs> yes, in terms of like the philosophical open mindedness, he would right. be a zero. In my Philosophy's opinion. getting a really good rep in this discussion. I don't know that everyone <laughs> would. Um, so all the bad people are uh, <laughs> right. zeros, and yeah. the philosophical ones are the the really good people. That now, funny side story, follow up to that. Same guy who threatened to fight me. Fast forward like five six years, I'm at the library with my kids, and it's like a magician thing that they're doing. This guy apparently had brought his grandkids to the library, okay? There's like 100 people. I'm there with my kids and a bunch of other people in this room waiting for this magician to start the show. I see the guy from across the room. He doesn't see me. I whisper to my son, Parker, at the time, who was like five years old. I say, remember that story I told you about the guy who wanted to fight me? He said, yeah. I said, he's right over there, but don't point, okay? I said, I'm going to show you where he's at, but don't point, don't say anything. He said, okay, I won't. I was like, you promise? 
I said, okay, he's that guy right over there with the red shirt on. Immediately, my son stands up. That guy right there? He sees me, makes eye contact. Like, oh. And he, re- he remembers yeah. this discussion. It was one of those moments where we both knew. Oh, was there any communication? No. It was thankfully like a And he's like 85 at this time. Yes. So. Oh, uh, and that's the other thing. Like, usually the older we get, the more, I don't know if laid backs necessarily, but the more open we Sort of get right, maybe. No, I don't know. Is that not true? Maybe with the more. I mean, there's that stereotypical grumpy old person. That's true. The older people get grumpier. I don't know. Yeah, maybe that's maybe the opposite. I don't know. Uh, I wanted to do before we move on. Get your general idea though, or take on money in general though. Like, do you think we need money? I mean, we've kind of touched on this before. Like, can we get on without money if money really is the root of all evil? Um, you know, what's the alternative? Yeah. I mean, that's hard to say because we're so far into it now, you know, like, and again, because we're all so used to this and like indoctrinated into this system, this capitalist economic system we have, it's, it seems impossible to pull money completely out of that. Um, I think there's certain aspects that we can pull money out of. So again, I won't give you a full committed answer here, but I think no, we can't pull money completely out of our society 100%, but I think there's definitely areas we could pull it out of realistically. I think politics is one, to be Oh, honest. for sure, yeah. I think it's not that it would be easy, but I think it's definitely doable that we could pull money out of politics and say, you're not allowed to advertise. Each candidate, for whatever office it is, is allowed you know, one free article in the newspaper or one hour on TV for a debate, right. but you get no special radio ads, you get no TV ads, you can't do anything extra. Each candidate gets equal amount of time and exposure to the public, no money involved. I think that's doable. I'm talking more general though. You know, I would love to get money out of that too. I'm I'm talking about money in general. Right. Like what? I don't think we can pull it out completely. And you mentioned, I feel like this capitalist uh, thing has come up before. I mean, we have money in other uh, systems as well, right? right? What is it about um, capitalism that makes you think it's uh, even more difficult than to to exist without money? Well, I think because for capitalism specifically, I mean, I'm not saying I necessarily believe this, but the big pushing point, the driver behind why capitalism is so good is because supposedly it spurs innovation, it spurs hard work and ingenuity, and it's it's the driver behind people wanting to do more and do better and move up and, and all those things. Whereas again, that's not to say how I view it, but the thought is it inspires progress. Right. Socialism on, on kind of moving the other way on the spectrum is viewed as well. That just breeds laziness because if you give everybody an equal amount, so let's say we don't have money, everyone's just given a certain amount of food and given a place to live. And then who's going to work hard? Who's what, going to, couldn't we have both systems though without money? Couldn't we, uh, you know, incentivize, you know, and I say a capitalist system with uh, other sorts of resources other than money or, or I don't know, like, I mean, in theory, in theory, you're saying like just goods and this other thing, like the actual creation of like currency and stuff. It seems like an extra step. Maybe. I don't know. I mean, I think if we go back to like the history of it, if, if we're to believe the history books, why money was invented is because bartering which was what they was using before that right Right. became too complicated because it was like way back early on it's like okay i'll give you a bear skin for some food well as society advanced and now we have vehicles and chairs and tables and we're all interconnected more too now yeah and it's like how do we assign value to that and how do we make sure it's an agreed upon value that yeah as you pointed to we're all connected so someone in north carolina united states might value cotton at this but over in some other part of the world, they value it completely differently. So assigning it a monetary value kind of gives us like a even playing field, so to speak, in terms of how do we trade these goods and services? It just seems like there's got to be a way to, I mean, if it arguably is the root of all evil, it has to be a way to, to do without, but maybe, I don't know, what I was just thinking is maybe it has something to do with, again, how big and civilized we're becoming. We're no longer these little small hunter-gatherer tribes um where you know are it seems like you could very easily exist exist without money um but is that possible now where literally you can communicate with people all over the world and um 
in terms of making things more expedient and so on, uh, is it just inevitable that you yeah, have it? Right. And I think for me, pulling the, the money, the bills, the currency out of it, you would still have the greed because it would just be like, well, instead of wanting $5 million, now I just want five different houses. So now you still get a shack, but I've accumulated five so houses. So why is it, so then money really isn't the root of all evil, it's greed. It's greed to me. It's like money is the value we assign to all these things, these materialistic things that we all need slash want. But it's it's not necessarily the currency itself. It's the it's the idea of wanting more and more and more and not caring if other people have nothing. Okay. So that's really the the issue that's causing so many. Which is a byproduct of capitalism, in my opinion. That capitalism. Well, yeah, I would agree with you there. I think it just uh, exacerbates all these yes. um, issues. And... 100%. Oh, wow. Okay. Where? Oh, my last one. Okay. So this is the last Josh Herring tailored question. So I've alluded to this before. I think of you as being one of the best, most invested parents I know of. This has always been true. Um, you know, again, just the fact that you have a daughter that just graduated and, and, you know, really thought about how she wanted to stay close to home. Again, the, the opposite mentality of many people <laughs> I know speaks to the, you doing something right. So, you know, what is it that you're doing right? What is the Harry and method? You, you had something about, what is it, dad, dad talks? Life lessons. Dad life lessons. So that's part of the Harry and method then. Yeah. <laughs> Ample um, dad life lessons. So, uh, in all seriousness, what what ha, what do you think you're doing right? Um, are you going to write a parenting book? Uh, I mean, this is uh, parents. I think some of us more so than others. It's something that's a lifelong struggle. And I mean, I really, it's, oh God, I had started getting gray hair the second I had kids, and literally, <laughs> it's happened firstborn. Um, it's just I struggle so much with it, and what really fascinates me is I put in so much thought into it and I still struggle so much. It's like, it just seems uh, so helpless sometimes, or I do, so hopeless. Yeah. Uh, so what is it, how, and the other thing you mentioned the other day is like, you still have your kids on 45 minutes screen limits. I don't know how you do it. I make my kids re revolt. Uh, I mean, I, I'm on this board. I, I would love to have that, but I got to stick with like an hour or two hours. Otherwise they go, I don't know. So how do you do it? Is it just because you, I think part of it was because we, in terms of the screens anyway, is that we kind of allowed an hour to happen. And then once that happened, then they got a little bit more and somewhere along the line. So was it maybe just setting a, a nice limit to begin with and staying firm with it? I don't know. Like, well, how do you get through all the days as a parent and like do your other stuff? They're like, how do you get stuff done too? I mean, not, not to say like, you know, throw your kids in front of the screens, but right. if they're just gonna, my problem personally is my two youngest fight all the time otherwise. So like, right. it's like, how do you get anything done either? You know, you work all day. It's like, how does a parent, help? what do we do? I mean, so first of all, I struggle with all the same things you struggle with. <laughs> so, okay, okay. So there's nothing that like, really? it's not like I'm- I don't oh, hear about the struggles. I mean, well, that's it. yeah, I mean, there's definitely still struggles and there's been plenty of times where I feel like, oh, what am I doing wrong? Like. I, I can't seem to get through on this particular issue or just doesn't seem to be working. So I definitely have struggles as every other parent does. I, so I think for me, you're doing something right. So what do you think you're doing? Right. What the things that I've really tried to focus on from a very early age is one, making them understand and being just very open and talking to them almost like you and I talk, to be honest. I talk to them as though they're just other human beings. I, do I, that too, yeah. I try not to talk down to them. And I, as much as they don't always enjoy my dad life lessons, I think that's one of the key components that I've used with them since Hannah was little. So going back, you know, 16, 17 years ago is instead of consequences, I try to ingrain in them why whatever behavior they did that I think needs to be corrected what the consequences of their behavior is on society, on themselves, on me, on their friends, whatever it is. So I'll just give you an example. So my two youngest, 11 and 10, they definitely fight too. Um, and I actually shared this story with, with Brad the other day. I found out during the day that an hour or so prior, they had both made two bets with each other. They had bet money, actual money, on the quiet game, who could be the quiet the longest, and on who 
would take the longest to get to their 45 minutes of screen time. Out of all bets your kids can be making, those are the bets I want to make. <laughs> so, they're going to not even go on screen. What was the other one? Quiet, quiet time. So who could be quiet the longest? They bet $5 on each of those. And so then I find out, they weren't necessarily trying to hide it from me, but they did this while I wasn't around them. And then later I'm like, why are you guys, you guys playing the quiet game? And then they wrote down for me because they wouldn't talk. They wrote down, we bet $5 for this. Def- oh, during the actual. Yes. So then when the contest was over, I sat them down and we had a long dad-like lesson, like 30, 40 minutes. And what I told them was, the bets are going through. That's fine. I'm not going to cancel them. You're not grounded. I'm not taking, I, I'm not a big believer in consequences. I, to me, those don't work. It only makes, in my opinion, with my experience. So like not putting them in time out. Or... Right. But my kids don't have punishments, to be honest. And I know that sounds maybe almost like too lax or like it was some hippie parenting technique. But I don't do punishments. Wow. I've never done like, oh, you're going to get spanked or timeouts or you get this taken away from you, no toys. Their punishment is having to listen to my life lesson, basically. Yeah. So what I did is I sat them down and I said, here's why I don't necessarily like that. Betting, for one, you're, you're maybe a little young, but that's not necessarily so bad. But the bigger issue to me is, one, Parker, you're older and you're maybe taking advantage of a younger sibling. You're taking advantage of someone who you may be brainwashed or convinced into doing this and she wasn't quite mentally aware of what was going on and you preyed on that. And she's your sibling, she's your family member. And I can almost always tell when I get through them because they have this look on their face of like, oh. of like they feel it. They, yeah. they feel the empathy for the other person. That's really what I'm driving home is empathy. If I could pick like one word, I'm trying to instill empathy in them in all situations because I think that serves human beings well all the way into adulthood. And so for McKenna, what I told her was, do you value this money? So they get paid a little bit of money for chores. They have to do chores every week and we have it scheduled out and they get paid just a couple dollars every week to do these chores. And I said, McKenna, think about it. If you lost both these bets, $10, that's five weeks, five weeks of chores that you threw away in two little stupid bets. And I said, think about people who don't have money and how much they would value having that $10. And you're just giving it away on some silly, frivolous game and think of what good that $10 could do. I could buy somebody food who's starving. And again, I saw it in her face when she's like, hmm. So for me, it's like, I, I there's no like magic formula I have and I still have struggles and they still do things wrong, of course. But I really try to help them see when they do well too, here's the great things that can come from it. But when you maybe aren't doing the best behaviors, here's what the consequences are. For you as a person going forward, and for others that it might be affecting. So empathy is a key word for me that I use a lot with them. Um, and again, as I mentioned, just being honest and open and talking to them as, as human beings to to not talk down to them. So I don't know. And, and again, it goes back to what I said earlier, you know, my purpose in life, I really have like just kind of taken the mindset. I want to put all my energy into them. So yeah. I, I feel like sometimes I sacrifice other things as all parents do, right. sacrificing other things just to, to stay home, be with them, and, and just to even chill. Sometimes it's not the exciting things, but it's just sitting on the couch. I know one thing that you always did early on, Brad's kids are a little younger than mine, but even as my kids were a little older, I always thought you were so good at encouraging their reading and reading with them and, and pushing them to read more advanced books. And I know that's something that I kind of plucked from your strategy, helpful, yeah. your toolkit. Because mm-hmm. I always read to my kids, but I feel like I wasn't pushing them to read in more higher level books and and so little things like that i think go a long way well i was going to say too uh, kind of along the lines of what you were saying earlier i think it's important to like or we can you know sometimes we just baby our kids and we you know they're seven so they're seven but right they're oftentimes a lot smarter than we think and so um you know explaining things to them uh talk, having serious discussions with them that a lot of people wouldn't necessarily uh, have with their kids at certain ages, uh, challenging them, like you said, you know, you're seven, I'm not going to just give you a book for a seven year old. Right. right. And I remember Zoe saying at one point, like trying to find, well, where's the, you know, whatever grade, I think, you know, first grade, where's the first grade? No, you know, pick out a book, challenge yourself. It doesn't right. have to be at that level or like math, you know, uh, they haven't done multiplication at a certain grade. Well, so, so what that doesn't mean that we can't talk about it, right. implement it when we're playing board games and so on, yeah. and have them figure it out early. Like, what does that, um, what does that hurt? And, uh, 
uh, again, uh, I think there's something that you kind of explain this to getting into not just saying what they did wrong. And then oftentimes for most parents, like doling out a punishment then, but right. actually sitting down and explaining, you know, why you think what they did was wrong or what was problematic about it. I think a lot of us as parents leave that out. I think that's, that's important. I just don't understand how you can, how you do so well without discipline or having to punish ever. Like, uh, cause if, for me, like kids, they're, they're gonna, if they, I don't know, there's no, there, there's, there's, but there's I, no, I distinguish punishment from discipline. I think discipline okay. and punishment are two different things. I think actually I actually have a lot of discipline and my kids would probably say, if you ask them, is your dad strict or pretty easy going? They'd say he's probably pretty strict. Really? So I have a, quite a few like guidelines and, and rules and boundaries in place. And to me, that's the discipline. The discipline okay. is the consistency that I'm not going to ever, not ever, but I'm going to rarely waver on these. But what happens and, if they don't comply though? And there's no punishment though? No punishment. So how do you get them to go along with the discipline? I mean, starting at a young age, I think was a big thing for me. So like when, you know, let's say my oldest daughter, Hannah, first got her first smartphone years ago. It was like we had many, many talks months before we ever got it. So it was like, when you get this, understand this is going to be a rule. This is a rule. These are the guidelines. This is what we expect. And so she just knew going in that those were the expectations from dad. And again, I explained it to her in a way like, oh, if you break this, it's not that I'm going to, if you break this rule, I'm not going to take your phone away, but I'm going to be disappointed. And I know this and that is, does it for you. It does in a lot of cases. My disappointment doesn't face my kids. Now, and I'll say one thing though about disappointment is I think I maybe have taken that even to an extreme because I know Hannah and I have had many talks just recently where she I've asked her like, okay, what's one of your biggest fears? We'll have these kind of philosophical right. talks. What's one of your biggest fears about picking a college when she was trying to decide? And she said, well. Here's a couple of them. She said, and one, I don't want to disappoint you. I want to be successful. I don't. And so at times I'm like, did I push this too right. far? This like idea of disappointing dad. So sometimes I have to scale back and I realize, oh man, maybe I've like said or pushed too far in certain ways or pushed certain buttons I shouldn't have. But I think again, my kids just know there's guidelines and expectations. And I think a lot of times, you know, I make plenty of mistakes too. But one thing I see parents do a lot, this is just from a bird's eye view. Okay. In a store, the kid's screaming. He's, you know, say a four-year-old kid screaming in the car. I want the toy. I want the toy. The parent says no. The kid screams a little more. He's like, fine, okay, you can have a toy. That doesn't happen with me. The screaming and then giving in. So that, how do you stop the screaming? They just scream. I mean, <laughs> I, I, from a very young age, I would just like have to take them out of the store. We go sit in the car and be like, you're just gonna sit in this car then. I'm like you're gonna sit here. And my kids know I'm, I'm a very, I'm not a materialistic person. So they, we've never like bought them toys. The only time they've ever got toys was for their birthday or Christmas. So again, I think they kind of grew up in this kind of framework that I had right. of like, here's these guidelines. And from an early age, they just knew, Hey, whining and screaming and throwing a fit isn't going to work. If, if I do go outside these boundaries or if I'm doing something inappropriate, dad's going to make me feel like, Oh, this shame and this guilt, I made somebody feel bad. And, so I don't know. And again, it doesn't always work. My kids still mess up and I still mess up. But I think those things have helped having discipline in place ahead of time and being really consistent with it and, and helping them see and understand what empathy is has yeah. helped a lot. I like that that buzzword empathy. Yeah. It goes to, again, what you said the meaning of life was for you. It kind of speaks to that, like helping others. And uh, maybe that'll clue them in, into it even before they have kids. Right? Right. Because you didn't really realize that until you had kids and yeah. kudos to you then for like trying to establish that early on. I don't, I mean, I guess, you know, parents, some parents, you know, stress helping others and thinking yeah. others, but to really have that as a focal point, I think that's not necessarily something that's too common. So, yeah. So I have a question for you. Yeah. Do you... Well, well, we're not to that part yet. Oh, okay. I'm just kidding. Go ahead. No, go ahead. No, no, I was just kidding. Okay. You can ask me. So there's a Q&A for me? Q yeah. Me? Okay. Yeah. Well, this one's related to this. Okay. Do you feel like, not exactly or not complete opposite maybe, but do you feel you are like your parents and how they parented you and how you parent your kids or are you much different mm -hmm. than how they were? Awesome question. Uh, so my parents were super strict, at least that was my impression. And uh, so I would, you know, came into parenting thinking I'm going to be the opposite, like totally 
flexible. And I think to a certain degree I am for the most part, pretty, you know, um, I would say what's the spectrum in terms of super strict versus what the opposite. I tend to be towards the opposite, but it's, it has been revelatory for me uh, because, you know, for example, you know, Jack way back, uh, he watched Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and we got, I don't know if I told you this, but you know, we got some uh, calls that he was being aggressive on the playground. This is when he was like five years old. Right. So, um, you know, I had to start exercising some censorship, right? I'm sorry, I can't let you, you know, watch these certain programs yet. Uh, you know, and that's, I remember when I came home at like 17, my mom had taken all my CDs because she realized that I had some of the explicit theories, right. right? I mean, so there's that. And I mean, that's not even close to, I thought that was strict, but that's just the, the tip of the iceberg in right. terms of, you know, I would get certain punishments that are, I thought that was crazy. And, and um, so, I mean, I'm nowhere near that, I feel like. So to answer your question, I feel like I'm the opposite. Okay. But, you know, I have uh, learned that, you know, maybe they they weren't so wrong, right? right? There's some merit to, you can't just let anything go. Right. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. I went into it thinking, okay, I'll be the real cool dad that lets, any, you know, let, lets them be who they want to be and do what they want to do. But it's got to be within limits, I think, is yeah. what I learned. So, yeah. Okay. Pretty early on. All right. Let's move on to the exciting part five, where we dive into the great philosophical abyss. Okay. Um, so I don't know. You probably never heard of this. This is a uh, when I first started teaching, I would open up class. Did I ever tell you about this? Yeah, you did. Okay. And so they, well, while I took a role, they would answer whatever question we had drawn for that day. So what we're going to do is you're going to take and uh, name three numbers between 1 and 82. Let's go one at a time. So, and okay. we'll answer them in turn. Six. Six. Oh, my. This is the coincidences. They become more and more as we age, I feel like. That's something I've expounded on, I feel like, to numerous people. The, you were the inspiration for this question. Okay. I think Jamie might have. The episode one, you might have drawn this one, too. Really? Would you eat a dead cricket for $10? <laughs> Okay. If not, would you for any price name your price? I already know the answer. The answer is yes. <laughs> I wouldn't yes. forget for ten dollars. So the question is how little? Most people would have to go up, right. if not, right? Like hundred. But how little? And it's probably changed over the years, no? Yeah, it's probably gone up a little. Oh. Back in the day, what Brad's referring to is I used to this used to be an ongoing thing. Not like I did it every day, but I would eat bugs for the right price. <laughs> See, I was much more willing than, than This is what we did at our parties, our yes. get together, right? So we would Egg Josh on to... Uh, yes. So, yes, I would definitely eat a cricket for $10. The lowest I'd probably go at this point in my life would be $8. $8. Okay, that's dead. Would it matter if it's live? Jamie did have this because I also made that distinction. I would, I would eat it dead. It has to be dead. Yeah. I don't want it squirming in my mouth. What if it's live? I don't... Well, it's going to name your price. I'll say $20. A oh, so it's doable. It's you just need doable. a little bit more money. Oh, yeah. Okay. Everything has a price. <laughs> really? I don't think that's true, actually. Mm. Remember how important your kids were? Yeah. <laughs> not everything. Well, All I mean, right. in terms of eating bugs. Oh, okay. Not every act. No okay, bugs. okay. Eating well, that's an important bugs. distinction there, yeah, Josh. Sorry, sorry. All right, so scorpions? It's not like a. I mean, are we talking they're, small. Like, they're poisonous? Like, kind of kill me if they sting me in the tongue? <laughs> okay, non poisonous. Non poisonous. So if it's non poisonous, we'll eat it. For the right price. For the right price. Okay. Another number. 36. Well, this is actually a pretty good one. Uh, we've probably all thought about this at some point. If you could, and it kind of touches on some of our other discussions, if you could live forever, in other words, be immortal, would you want to? No, 100%. That was quick. 100% so. not. And my kids and I have talked about this a lot, actually. Um, I have said to them, half kidding, of course, that I think I'll be... I'll set the record for living the longest ever. <laughs> Half kidding. That's but, funny because I tell my kids I'm going to live to 180. Yeah, what? so it's very similar. I say something similar, like I'll live to be 150 or whatever. Because I, I try to eat right, I try to exercise, and my kids see that. and they Science see, is progressing? Yeah. Who's to say it's not? And yeah. so they, they will like somewhat believe that and somewhat laugh at me. But uh, no, I wouldn't want to live forever. I think, one, you have to suffer through seeing all your close friends and family, everyone dying around you. People say that a lot. So what if we could throw in the caveat, 
everyone else can be immortal too. Then still no, because I think there's something to knowing that there is an end that makes life more enriching. It makes you cherish moments more. It makes you appreciate things more. Um, so there's definitely a factor of, okay, I, I am mortal. There, this isn't going to last forever. I have to I need, do this now. Yeah, I need to take right. advantage of these moments. And I think it makes them more special. If you're immortal, it's like, oh, I just did something really amazing. I climbed, climbed Mount Elbert with a good I friend. do that in seven centuries. Yeah, like who this. cares? I'll just do that a thousand years from now. Why did I waste my time right now? Yeah, so definitely not. Okay, well, that's easy enough. Both of these have been pretty easy for you. Okay, another one, last one. Uh, 23. Do we need prisons? Ooh, that's a good one. I think we do need prisons, but we need a hell of a lot less. <laughs> I think we have so many people in prisons for, I'll just particularly touch on one, non-violent crimes. And we haven't been in prison for 10, 20 years, I think. I mean, yes, I think we do need prisons because there are extremely violent people that potentially could not be rehabilitated right. and just to keep other people in society safe. I don't, I don't think it's permissible to just allow dangerous, violent people to roam around. So yes, I think we need them, but I think we could drastically cut the number of prisons we Scale have. It back, yeah. Yeah. What are your thoughts on privately run? Yeah. I mean, I think there's obviously going back to greed, there's so many incentives in there for those private companies to manipulate like the a system. Bad idea. Yeah. They manipulate the system in so many ways just to make more money. That being said, government-run agencies typically aren't very efficient either, so it, it's hard. Um, I think, again, to me, there's always, like... Not but it always. wouldn't be about profit, though, right? I mean, if it was just a True. government utility almost, right, versus a private industry right, where you're literally making money as a business. Right. There's, there's definitely huge problems with that. The problem I see with the government, like... Entity, agency. And I don't agency. like government involvement. In yeah. I, is the inefficiency in terms of like, I don't know, private companies are allowed to, and not that they have many incentives to do this, but they're able to progress and adapt and upgrade and evolve quicker than I think government agencies would be with all the red tape and they have to get approval from Congress and all these things. Right. Um, so neither one's ideal, but private is definitely not good. You know, I've never encountered anyone now that I think about it who's like, yeah, privately owned prisons. That's a good idea. Yes, yeah, definitely. Other than maybe the the people that own the private. <laughs> right. uh, oh, okay. I think you survived the the abyss. I made it out of the abyss. So we're on to part six. It's a fun little part here. The Socratic genie is going to grant you any three wishes. Oh boy. So three wishes go. Um. I was, it's a tough one, like when you haven't. I know. So many possibilities. I would say. And just my imagination is the only limit. I think so. Okay, so I would say one. Or are you determined in another ways? I don't know. I would say <laughs> one, um, $50 million. Why not 100? I think $50 million. <laughs> you don't want too much, it'll right. cause problems. $50 so, million. <laughs> Fifty million, okay. Um, because I'm a firm believer in money does not necessarily equate to happiness, but money. But, some. In, but money in our society equates to options. Money equals options. And options equals happiness. In a lot of cases, it can because so. I mean, somebody who doesn't have money, it affects them in so many ways, right? Like they don't have the option to. No, for sure. Yeah. Going to a nice hospital when they're sick because they have no money. Like they don't have the option to go into a nice. Or hospital. to go to a university and discover yeah. the subject that they're actually truly right. passionate about. So. $50 million that my kids would be safe and healthy until the day I die. But not afterwards. Well, at least that long. <laughs> Give me a guarantee. Until well, that sounds very selfish. I want to just get through my life <laughs> knowing they're okay. And then well, you know what happens afterwards. I, I, you want to revise that? Mary? Well, no? I want to refrain from giving them like a certain age to die. Like, I want Hannah to die at 90. I want her to die at 94. So I want them to live a happy, long, healthy life. Long, happy life. Okay. Long, whatever that is. And third, the answers to all these deep philosophical questions. I would like to have access to that other untapped potential in our brains whenever I wanted. 
I want to be able to tap into that at any moment. You think science is going to get there eventually, right? So I maybe, think eventually. So you'd really like to just get that? Yes, because I don't think there's going to get there in my lifetime, even though I might live to be 150. Why not? Too, too much? Yeah, there's too, we're too far away, I think. But I want to be able to, at any moment, like pull that curtain back and access it. And then you would actually know. Well, that in some sense, that would probably answer a lot of the questions. Right. right? Hopefully that would lead me so to... So by way of that, then you would actually get the... I'd get much closer to the truth of a lot of these things, I would hope. Or, yeah, who knows? I mean, the thought would be that, right? I think that's... Oh, no, it's not that part. Part seven. Okay. Ask me anything philosophical. Oh, boy. You can ask me anything or nothing. It's up to you. Well, I definitely want so to ask you something. Anything that you've wondered about over the years in terms of... See, the thing is with us, though, we've probably discussed it all already. We probably have when discussed you, most of it. When you wonder, you just ask me, right? Yeah, we've asked so many questions back and forth. Um, but I'll ask. I, I think I have one here that just came to mind. If you had to go back to senior year Brad, senior year in high school, and you would have been only 17? Yes. Yeah, because you were young. And you had to go to another school outside of Nebraska, so you couldn't go to a school in Nebraska. And I know money is obviously a factor. There. Let's take the money out of it. Right. So you're going to another school. Money's not a factor. And you can't major in philosophy. And I'll even give you another option. You don't even have to go to college. You could choose to do something else. What would you do with your life if you had to choose a different path? Can't be a college in Nebraska, and it can't be majoring in philosophy at some other institution. Well, interestingly, I don't know if I told you this. I mean, it was like of a fork. There's two, two uh, routes that I was seriously considering, philosophy and then engineering. And okay. I had scholarships to you know, numerous places um, for, uh, for the engineering and uh, so I almost, you know, went that route, uh, but I went with my heart yeah. and what, I mean, ultimately, you know, really was my obsession and that's what was the impetus for philosophy, but it was really close. So, you know, what would I go into? Uh, so back then, if I was answering this, it would have been engineering then, and I would have picked, you know, one of the other schools. I mean, my dream school back then was University of Chicago, but that was, you that, yeah. but that was, you know, uh, oriented or that was because of philosophy, not necessarily, you know, the engineering. So if it was a different field, then it, you know, back then when I was answering, it would have been engineering and say one of these other schools just that uh, I had a scholarship to in terms of engineering or one of the, the really good, you know, tech schools or engineering schools. Now here comes the Caltech. philosophical part. Yeah. How different would your life be? Would you say it's just nothing's the same, completely different life? Well, hold, hold on one second, because I think if I was answering it now, I would probably go into like physics. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So. Oh, okay. If, Sorry. No, that's okay. So back then, right, it was engineering or philosophy. But uh, over the years, right, you ask all these philosophical questions, and you realize I don't even understand reality, right? Mm -hmm. Like, never mind these philosophical questions about reality. Like, what is actually happening? Right. And so I become very much interested in physics uh, and chemistry as well. You know, unlocking different aspects of our neurobiology. Uh, so I would say, I and mean, I don't have a specific school per se, but definitely some aspect of that, whether it's physics or chemistry or something about unlocking. Okay, so now how different would your life be? And not just the physical materialistic life of, oh, I live in a different I'd have city, a lot more money. <laughs> that sort of thing. Yeah. I, I might have married someone different, so I would have never met. I wouldn't have met, yeah, that's cool, yeah. But how different would your way of looking at the world be? Again, impossible to answer, right? But I've always been philosophical to the core, so it's hard for me to imagine that it would really be that significantly different. Okay. Just because, you know, being philosophical is so ingrained in my personality. All right. Now, granted, if I went into these other fields and pursuits, I'd have other influ influencing factors that, you know, would likely. I mean, obviously, I probably wouldn't devote as much time to it, right? right? I, um, I wouldn't be as afforded as much time to, you know, uh, explore these different aspects of philosophy that interest me and write about them. You know, I, I would have to do whatever it is these other guys do, right? right so, right. Um, so surely it would be uh, reduced, right, my philosophy or how much I did it. But I don't 
think it would be that significant. You still have a strong passion. I for think it. so, just because it's so, it's so, and that's basically like the defining feature of myself. I would say. So now, where did that come from? Are you saying that's just genetic somehow in your I have no DNA? Idea. That was just part of your biology. You're gonna. I don't know where it comes from. I just know it is. Were you your know? parents very philosophical? Not really. I mean, you know, they would be open to discussing things. Right. And they weren't, I wouldn't say they were, um, like, you know, how it contrasted being philosophical. It's like not questioning anything. Right. And again, maybe that's not really fair, uh, because I would say they weren't philosophical, but they were open too. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they questioned things when necessary and so on. So, but I wouldn't say they were, we didn't sit down and chat about deep issues, you know, right. um, and of course, you know, I wasn't brought up as, in any religion so i think a lot of times for better or worse you know people that grow up in religious households they might have maybe more philosophical discussions right. they might be slanted in certain ways right but um so no they i wouldn't describe them as i don't know where it come, came from because i wouldn't describe them as that philosophical per se and none of my extended family um i don't know it's so i don't know where it's just from. like genetics somehow like well, wouldn't that be the opposite? Because if, if it was genetics, then they would show that, right? Well, not necessarily. Maybe it came from your great great Well, that's what I was saying. Like, none of my... I, I don't remember any of my extended family. Yeah, I got you. Any, anybody. I was saying more of like, was it like your environment that you grew up in or more to somebody in your Actually, DNA? that's a great... Yeah, so I don't think it's DNA. I don't think it's... Uh, because it, I didn't see it in my family. And great distinction because I think it was my environment... What made me philosophical was probably because I grew up with so many people that were religious, right? 99%. I was like literally the only, and I've written about this in my dissertation, for right. example. Literally the only one I knew who didn't believe, you know, it's not that I believed God didn't exist, but didn't have this, um, you know, positive belief in God, that God does exist. And I remember actually, this a freshman year in high school, I was having a discussion with one of my classmates. And uh, I mentioned how I didn't necessarily believe in God. And he literally like, Brad, doesn't, can you guys believe this? He said it out loud, like right. the whole class. And I'm like. Which is pretty horrible as a freshman in high school. It wasn't. I mean, we were, we were friends. It okay. wasn't that. I mean, it wasn't like I was in. And in fact, it kind of just, you know, I'm the type where like if I get grief like that, I'll just, you know, I'll become more resolute. Like, kind of it, emboldens you. Yeah. Like, yeah, who you. are you guys? You know, like, right. have you actually thought about this? Like. Right. I mean, I've, I've given this a lot of thought, and no, right now I don't, you know? Okay. So, so actually, I, I think, I, thank you for bringing up the, I think it probably was the environment. Okay. Just because everyone tended to believe in, maybe it wasn't just religion either, but that was probably the big one. And like, why? Because it's so, such a focal point for so many people. Right. Every Sunday, everyone I knew, and I'm not doing that, that's going to make me question that, right? Or at least yeah. if you have any semblance of a philosophical nature, it's going to get that process going. Probably. And part of that, a little bit early on, I think before you're an adult, I think early on, part of that maybe comes from being a little bit of a maverick too, right? Having a personality. You're not afraid right. to be your own person. You're not afraid. Because so many kids a at a young age like just go with the flow, even though internally they maybe question it. Maybe right, like, hey, right. I don't know if I believe it, but they'll go it's along with it. It's too hard. Yeah, it's, it's... And for me, like you helped unlock that philosophical aspect for me. But I know in high school, I definitely felt kind of like a maverick. And this is a small example, but like rap music. I was very much into rap music at like 14, 15, 16. But in Little Pierce, Nebraska, mm. I can tell you I was the only one. Right, right. And I was called a gangster wannabe and all this stuff because everyone else, of course, was listening to nothing but country. But I wasn't afraid to be like, I don't care. I yeah. like rap music. I like Tupac. This is what I do. Yeah. yeah. So I think having that maverick personality really on helps maybe open – that right, yeah. I mean, I think that, yeah, combined with maybe the environment aspect, yeah. and then, yeah, having it be so pronounced the other way with everyone else, yeah. having a certain sort of personality, maverick, or however you want to put it, where um, you're not going to just go with what everyone is, yes. right? So there is this differing opinion that's, you know, significantly different than yours, but yet you will still um, sort of stand up for and right. question it, stand up for the opposite, maybe, and question what is the, not only the majority of you, but it was, like I said, no one. I didn't knew no one else. Yeah, that, um, I can imagine. Now, that's not to say maybe, you know, they didn't and I just didn't know. But everyone right. I knew, so far as I knew, um, not only did they believe in God, but, you know, went to church weekly. And right. presumably that was the case for everyone oh, yeah. in Pierce as well. Yeah, so. for sure.
Okay, I asked like four questions there. Yeah, that's fine. One. Oh, I thought you had another one. Is that? No, I think that's good. Yeah. Okay, well, that's good, man. You and Jamie had a. I remember him having some some good ones for me. I don't know. I feel like you guys both did great. I feel like uh, I don't know how you didn't have, have didn't like game plan for it. like getting some <laughs> of your your answers, especially when it was get into the philosophy and uh, your answers to the big questions. You had some well, we, really fleshed out. That's true. We've yeah, discussed them. I've thought about it a lot. Yeah. We've talked about it a lot. Like, So I think I'm at a little bit. I think if you brought in somebody outside our friend group who yeah. wasn't in philosophy, it would be a little different. Yeah, a little yeah, more challenging. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, I think that's, that's it. That was a long one. Uh, anything else, Josh, or should we wrap this one up? I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you, though, for having yeah, me. I appreciate it. Very fun. Uh, I meant to thank thank you as well. I may, might have at the very beginning, but I uh, do want to reiterate, I realize that this is not easy coming on and like basically revealing you know who you are and getting into some very personal uh, opinions and beliefs about very controversial, controversial issues. All right. Um, uh, not not easy. So thanks for, uh, to you for, for coming on and hopefully you enjoyed it. And, it's great. It's just like hanging out with you. This is like what we do. Yeah, this is out. pretty much normal. Uh, yeah. We just don't record the other ones. Right. So. Well, that's it. Uh, thanks again for joining us for the Philosopher's Couch episode two with Josh Herring. And stay tuned. We might have uh, the other person with us on this trip for uh, episode three. So stay tuned for that. Thank you. Thanks, Brad. Yeah.